Hi, I'm Thomas Ryan, and I'm hosting Shoreline's brand new podcast. During our Intellectual Barriers to Faith series, we've been talking to folks from around Shoreline's community who operate in an intellectual setting every day. Here's a quick sample of my conversation with Jeff Prince. He runs his own law firm and is a graduate from Harvard Law School and Harvard Divinity School. There's nothing new under the sun in that regard. Yeah. I mean, people have been wrestling with faith issues. I mean, you look in the Bible, you see poor Job is really wrestling with it. He stands by God, but boy, all the people around. And he got bad advice. He was getting people standing around him saying, well, just curse God and die. Well, you know, obviously, you know, choose your, choose your helpers wisely. Yeah, (laughs) But uh, it's, it's all the way back to the Bible. There's nothing new when your intellectual struggles with faith are go all the way back to the beginning of time. Yeah. And, you know, I think God, you know, part of it is that God created us to have free will. He yeah. made us the most intelligent uh, being in all of creation. Yeah. And he gave us free will. Yeah. You know, and so by having free will, that means he can't, he's not going to force us yeah. to choose him. He's not going to force us to choose faith. What's the value in that as a Christian um, of really taking these things seriously and having a response uh, um for things like the problem of evil, uh, and you know, and don't, you don't have to become a, a scholar on that thing, but but having a response, wh- wh- why why do we bother with that? Well, I, there's probably several reasons. Um, one, because people are going to come to you that are wrestling with those kind mm-hmm. of issues, and it's and it's nice to have had an opportunity to look at them honestly yourself. Mm-hmm. That way, you can talk to someone else about it. Two, you're going to go through it at some point. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, to the, to the extent that you've wrestled with those issues in, in times when it's not, you know, when, when, the, when the trouble times aren't, aren't around, mm. then, you know, you're going to benefit from having had that time. Three, God made us intellectually curious. Yeah. I mean, we are curious people. We want to learn. I mean, why do you think science is advancing at the rate that it is? Because humans want to figure out answers to everything. Mm-hmm. God created that. That's a core need in us is to is to learn and to and to figure out answers to tough questions. Yeah. And I, I think it's I think it actually is part of that core need, which is we're trying to find God. Mm. You know, we're trying to have that relationship with God. Sometimes we get it misplaced in some people, you know, pursue intellectual things for the pursuit of, for its own sake. Yeah. You know, they're missing out. What they're really wanting is to find God. Yeah. You know, God created this need in humans to search and it's to search in all forms and fashions and and areas of life. Um, but it's all ultimately pointing back to him. Yeah. You know, and that's, and I think that's the value of, of dealing with tough questions like the problem of evil. Sometimes we have to wrestle and go through all the, all the arguments to get to that point, but yeah. you, you, you'll figure it out if you really wrestle with it. Indeed. To hear the full interview, make sure to check out the podcast. You can find it online at shorelinechurch.org. Go to the resources tab, click on media, and scroll down. Or you can access it on your phone, tablet, or computer through iTunes. Just go to the iTunes store or your podcast app and search Intellectual Barriers to Faith. Hey, Shoreline. Uh, My name is Zach Harney, and I am here today uh, just humbled and grateful to get a chance uh, to speak with you. I'm uh, the spiritual development pastor here at Shoreline, which means I'm over a few different areas, growth groups, classes, Bible studies, baptism, and a bunch of other things. Uh, And I was approached about seven or eight months ago to talk within this series as we were laying the whole year out. And so I got a chance to look at all the different topics and pick one. And the one I picked is the one that Jeff just mentioned in that video, which is, you know, the problem of evil, the problem of pain and suffering. And I thought, okay, that's the one I'm going to do. So I picked it, and I think it was probably only about five minutes later that I started to think about it a little bit more. And I said, why on earth did I do that? (laughs) Because... This question is literally one of the most difficult things, and for for many people, it's the biggest barrier that keeps them from embracing God. There's many people who aren't here today. They're somewhere else. They've decided not to come to church because of this very question. They've said, I can't believe that there's a God who is all-powerful, 
all loving, and would allow the pain and suffering I see in the world. So therefore, I'm not going to explore it. I'm not going to do this. And that's a huge barrier for people. So uh, just to kind of lay it out, what is this intellectual barrier that we're facing that we're going to talk about today? It's this. As Christians, we say that we believe in a God who is powerful enough to shape everything we see around us. And at the same time, a God who loves us more than we could ever imagine. But also, that there's pain and suffering, and oftentimes from our perspective, pointless pain and suffering that happens all the time. We see it all around the world. So that's what we're dealing with. This is a massive barrier for some people as they try to grapple with what it means to be a Christian and to follow God amidst pain and suffering. Um, and really, I guess the question we're trying to answer today is not so much even how do we deal with this philosophical idea, but what does it look like in our own lives? Is it possible to, in the midst of tragedy and suffering, to be able to continue following God with assurance, with strength, and, and to continue to believe? And my answer would be yes. Many of you are here today in the midst of that, and you're still continuing to try. But for those of you who are in this service right now and who got to hear that beautiful song that we did for giving back, it's a song called It Is Well, and it's a remake of an old hymn. And this song has a beautiful story, tragic but, but just encouraging story behind it. So there's a man named Horatio Spafford, and he wrote this song, It Is Well, in the late 1800s. And, and what happened was he actually had sent his four daughters and his wife across the Atlantic Ocean on a boat to go to England for a holiday, and he was going to follow them shortly after. Well, during their journey, something happened with the boat, and it sank. And in one quick moment, he lost all four of his daughters. His wife survived, and as he was hearing about this tragedy, he got a telegram from his wife. And it just said simply this, saved, period, alone, period. And he had to process that. And he had to think, what does this mean for me? How could this happen? He's a Christian and he's dealing with this. And he gets on a boat and he sails across the Atlantic Ocean, the same route that his daughters and wife had to go be with his wife in this time of of pain and suffering. And during that very boat ride is when he wrote this song. It was as he was looking out over the water and considering all that he was going to deal with over the next few years and what this meant for him and the rest of his life. And somehow, in the midst of that, he wrote this song. I can't explain to you how he did that. I don't even think I would have the strength to do it. But it's possible. And we've seen that through his life and through the lives of many other Christians through the years and what they've persevered through and what they've done because of what they've known about Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about today because that's the important question. You know, there is this philosophical argument against God that people use to say, well, you can't have a God who's all-powerful, who created the universe and has the ability to change things and to you know, speak into our daily lives and also a God that loves us intimately, cares about us, knows us individually. You can't have those two things when we look at all the pain and suffering. It doesn't make sense, logically. That's what they would say. But at the end of the day, uh, for most of us, the way we think about this question is not on a philosophical level, I think. You know, when we think about this question, we ask it in a different form. For myself, I've asked this question and said, why did one of my best friends have to die an early death in a sudden car accident when you say that you're all powerful and you have control over what goes on and you say you love me, you say you love this person, how can that be? For some of you, it might be that you say, how could I have been allowed to be raised in the setting I was? Terrible things happened to me in my childhood that I can never forget. How is that possible that we can say there's a loving God and a powerful God that's in the midst of all that? 
It might be that you're in the middle of a relationship that's just gone sour. Maybe you're married, maybe you're before marriage, but you're trying everything you can to pour into it, and it just doesn't seem to be producing what you want. And, and you wonder, how can I keep going through this pain as I'm trying to restore this relationship, as I'm trying to make this right, and I'm doing everything I can, and I still am in pain. I'm still feeling suffering when I'm in this relationship. Though That's really the version of the question that we have to deal with, you know? Because there's really three ways to look at this question. One is from a philosophical angle, which we'll talk about briefly. Another is from the biblical perspective. You know, what does the Bible say about this particular issue? And also, it's a personal issue. It's something that we have to wrestle with, and it looks different in every person's lives. So we're going to talk about all three of those. But I just want to open up with the philosophical Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Actually, what I did uh, so that I would be allowed to shorten this section a little bit <laughs> was I did an hour-long podcast with Thomas Ryan and all on just these different angles of the philosophical question. So if you're really into philosophy or if you get to the end of the message today and you say, I, I really I wanted a little bit more of you know, how do we logically think about this, I, there's about an hour-long podcast that's going to be up tomorrow that any of you can go download, take a listen to, and kind of dig in deeper, because um, I'm only going to touch the surface. I could go for hours on this. We've got 30 minutes. So, um, But at its essence, the philosophical question is pretty much exactly what I've already stated, that this, this man named Epicurus, over 2,000 years ago, created something that's now known as the Epicurean Paradox. And it's that question stated he said, you cannot believe in a God that is all-powerful, that loves you intimately and cares about you when you see all the pain and suffering that exists in the world. He said, those three things do not make, logically make sense together. And this was a debate between Christians and non-Christians, between other religious people, I mean, for Basically, until today, for over 2,000 years, this has been discussed and talked about, and there's philosophers way smarter than I am working on this and talking about this. But it's been in the last about century that the argument has kind of settled down because there's men like Alvin Plantinga. He's a Christian philosopher, and if you're really interested in philosophy, um, check out this book, God, Freedom, and Evil. It's extremely dense, has logic equations, and it's... Only if you're really interested in it. Otherwise, ignore that book. But know <laughs> that he did, actually through this book and through the work of some other Christian philosophers, get us to a point where almost no atheist philosophers will even argue that there's a logical problem of evil anymore. Because what it is, is it's, it's trying to say that God could not exist because of these two things. And that's just a really difficult thing to do. And what Plantinga did is show that that argument is actually bankrupt. And so what he did is he takes a look at those three different pieces of the argument. He says, okay, what does it mean to have an all-powerful God? How do we make sense of that? He says, what does it mean to have an all-loving God? If we, when we say all-loving and a God that cares about us, are we simply saying he would do whatever I wanted him to do and that's what would define him as loving? You know, you can't just use those terms and not define what you mean by them. But even more importantly, as you look at that aspect of pain and suffering, and what Plantinga and others realized is there's a hidden premise in that argument that for pain and suffering to be what disproves an all-powerful and loving God, it would have to be pointless pain and suffering. Because if God had a purpose for it, then that actually justifies and confirms that there could be an all-powerful God who loved us, who had a greater purpose of this pain and suffering. So uh, through all this debate, I'm going to talk about a lot of that stuff on the podcast if you want to listen, but I can't go really in-depth on the philosophical because it's so deep and so vast. But that's kind of the, the overall gist of the philosophical argument. But you know, the reality is, like I said, it's not really where a lot of people land on that. A lot of people are wrestling with it from a biblical perspective and from a personal perspective more than they are from a philosophical. And I found this out in my own life on January 13th, 
2012. Can you bring up that picture? So I got a call. It was about five in the evening. I remember exactly where I was from my friend Drew, who's up at the top with me. And he said two words that just absolutely rocked my world and changed my perspective on a lot of things and made me wrestle with so much since then. And he just simply said, Chad's dead. And Chad is the guy with the shaved head right there. He's not only one of my best friends, but he's Drew's older brother. Or he was Drew's older brother. And my brain went numb. The room went fuzzy. I didn't know what to think. I couldn't even come to terms with it for a little while. And eventually, I was able to start processing it. And I thought, can this be true? Can this have actually happened? Will I look in two months when I'm getting married and not see him there in my wedding party? Is he never going to meet my kids? Is he never going to teach them things that I can't teach them? He was just one of the most amazing um, car repair guys. and just He, he was so genius with, with his hands and, and, and things that I was just planning. Oh, that's... that's how Chad's going to feed into my kids' lives, all these things, you, know, you plan for the future. And it's not going to happen. That's the last picture I'll ever take with him. And the last time I saw him is the last time I'll ever see him. And that's when this question strikes home, and that's when it becomes real, is when it actually affects you on a personal level. And that's what many of you are wrestling with today. You know, I just want to ask you a simple question. When was that moment for you? When was that moment that you sat there and realized, can I deal with this? Can I believe in a God that would allow this to happen? Because I think many of you have had that moment already. And if you haven't, I hate to break it to you, but you will at some point. At some point, you're going to have that moment where you say, how could this possibly happen? And unfortunately, there's no easy answers for this question. There's a reason why it's the biggest barrier, and it's lasted for so long as this point of debate. Uh, but we're going to wrestle with that today, and we're going we're to try to work through it. So we talked about the philosophical a little bit, but I want to move on to the biblical. What is the biblical perspective on pain and suffering? So number one, I think that pain and suffering can be a consequence. Now, I don't want anybody to misinterpret that as pain and suffering is a consequence of our behavior because I don't think that that's true. I don't think that our pain and suffering is solely because of things that we've done. I think that's false. But I think that sometimes it is. And I think we can understand that as we take a look at some biblical pictures of this. So we look at the story of Jonah as he is called by God to go to Nineveh, to this pagan city, and preach the gospel. And he says, nope, not doing that. <laughs> and he go, gets on a boat and sails west rather than traveling east. And because of that decision to go a different way, this storm comes on the boat. And it not only affects him negatively, but it also actually affects the entire boat of people that are around him. So his, his pain and suffering also affected other people around him. The, the choice he made had consequences to not only him, but also to the people that were around him. And sometimes that can be what pain and suffering is. Sometimes it's a consequence. Think about the man or woman who takes two months' worth of paychecks, goes to the casino, spends it all, they can't make rent, and all of a sudden they lose their home, and he falls on his knees or she falls on her knees and says, why, God, why did you do this to me? There's a simple answer to that, and it involves a mirror. <laughs> you don't, I mean, that's just, it, that's an easy question to answer, okay? You made these decisions, and there are certain consequences to your decisions. Imagine a man or woman who gets in the car, they've had too much to drink, they know they've had too much to drink, but they do it anyway. 
and they drive and say, ah, it's just a little ways home, I can make it, and they get in a car accident, and they ruin someone's life. They have to deal with that. And the question might come to their head, why, God, would you allow this to happen and for these events to collide? But the answer is right there. You know, for some, some pain and suffering that we feel and that, that we experience is actually because of a consequence of our behavior. Not always, but sometimes it is. And if that's the case, we need to look inward at ourselves and say, what do I need to change? How do I need to get right with God so I can get back on the right track and we need to stop putting that blame other places than where it should be? But that's not always the case. Often it's not the case. Because two, sometimes suffering can be for a greater good. And we actually see that further down the road. We, we look back on something and we say, you know what, I needed to grow there. I needed that. Or sometimes we look back and say, you know, that was really tough but I was able to minister to another person who went through the same thing and bring them hope and bring them peace. And sometimes, pain and suffering can be for a greater good. I saw this very clearly recently when thinking about this young woman who some of you might know at this church. Her name's Julianne Sherman. And it was about a year ago, she got in a very, very bad car accident. She was on her way it was a Sunday morning, I remember hearing the news, and she was up, going up to San Francisco to visit her parents in Hawaii with her brother. And when this accident happened, there was calls made, and we were trying to figure out what was going on, but in the end, we found out, okay, they made it, she made it through, but this is gonna be an intense recovery. This is gonna take months of rehabilitation, and it's gonna be hard, and it's gonna be painful. And there's nothing easy about that time. But I want to show you something that came out of that. I want to show you a picture of her and her physical trainer, the one that helped her through these months of rehabilitation. I want to show you a picture of them. <laughs> That's Luke. And she met him through the midst of this pain and tragedy. She met him because of it. And let me tell you, knowing those two people, to find someone that they could spend the rest of their lives with, however much time they have, together, that was one of the deepest desires of their soul. And I'm not taking anything away from the pain and suffering that was involved in that whole process, but I can tell you three weeks ago, at their wedding, there was almost no talk of that. There was talk of how amazing this process was in which they met. The circumstances, though painful, brought them together. You know, and that's, that's a quick turnaround. That's, you know, been, you know, around a year, a little bit longer. But it's not always like that. And that gets to the third point. That sometimes suffering can be for reasons we will never understand. That's the story of Job. We look at this story, and if you haven't read the book of Job, I encourage you to. I think it's one of the most beautifully written pieces in the entire Bible. Um, we look at the story, and we see a cosmic battle going on. We see this person under great physical suffering and great stress, and the things that are happening to him are almost unimaginable for most of us. But there's this battle going on. And as the reader, we get to see it. We get to see what's actually taking place on this grander scale. But you know who never gets the full picture? Job. Even amidst all of his pain and suffering, even amidst all this questioning, he's asking God why, he's wrestling with this idea with his friends, he never gets insight into why it's happening. We know it happened not only because he would be restored through it and prove that he was faithful to God, but also because we're sitting here, you know, thousands of years later, still discussing it and still using his, him as an example and still finding strength in what he went through. 
And that's why he went through it. But he never knew that, not even in his lifetime. He knows it now, but he didn't know it then. And sometimes I think that pain and suffering can be for reasons that we will never understand. And that's hard. That's hard to take in. That's why this topic I don't think is talked about very much. Because it's hard to get up in front of people and say, sometimes we don't know. But I believe that's the case. We look at the story of Job, and that is the case. And some of you are sitting here today, and you're sitting here just like Job amidst this pile of ashes, and the the world is crashing around you, and you're trying to put the pieces back together, and you're trying to figure out how to handle this questioning and this hurt and pain and trying to figure out what does it all mean? You want answers. Well, looking at Job shows that sometimes we will spend years and years not knowing. So what do we do? What do we do in that time? Do we just give up? No. We need to think about not only what pain and suffering is, but what it isn't. Okay, if we don't know in a certain situation why things are happening or what pain and suffering is, then at the very least we can look at what the Bible says about what it isn't. So number one, we can know that God does not view suffering as an illusion. Okay, there's a a thought process among many Eastern religions, some New Age thought, um, even old Greek thought, that says, you know how you eliminate pain and suffering is you realize that it's not actually real. The only reason you feel pain and suffering is because you're too attached to the things of this world. You're too attached to the people you know. You're too attached to the things you have. You're too attached to ideas that you hold dear. And if you can separate yourself, if you can detach from those people, you will realize that suffering is only a feeling that you have because you're too attached to things, okay? And you need to realize that it's not real. It's just something you imagine because you're too attached. That's not true. (laughs) Uh, Simply, the Bible says that is not true. The Bible says that pain and suffering is real. Listen to what Jesus says in John 16, 33. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So that verse does not say, in this world you may have trouble. It says, in this world you will have trouble. That's kind of scary. You know, there's a, oftentimes the, the idea of what a perfect life would be is if we can avoid all hardship by preparing for every situation and never face anything that's hard. But the reality is, is that we will face things that are hard. This world is broken. Since the fall, things have been different. They've been hard to deal with. There's grief, and there's sin, and there's pain that entered the world. And we are living in that reality between the fall and the future that we have in heaven. We're living in that land in between. So we know that pain is real. So how do we process that? Well, look at, look at David. Look at him throughout the Psalms. And he is constantly agonizing over his own life. He is asking God, why is this happening? What's going on? He, even to the point of anger with God. He's upset. I mean, there's some of them, you read some of the Psalms, and it's just him screaming at God. You can almost sense it. But we still call David a man after God's own heart. And why is that? Why do we call King David a man after God's own heart when he's so often questioning and upset with God? It's because amidst that, he's staying in relationship with him. Okay, he's, he's not saying, well, since you're not answering me right now, I'm going to walk away. He's saying, I'm going to continue. I'm upset with you. I don't like the situation I'm in. And... I can't stand it, but I'm going to continue to pursue a relationship with you. I'm going to continue to seek restoration with you amidst all of this pain. And that's what makes him a man after God's own heart, is because he continues to try. 
And I think even more importantly, probably the most important thing that we know pain and suffering is not an illusion comes in a verse that's only two words long. And for those of you who were here last week, you heard Zoe mention it in that little clip from the podcast. She said it's an extremely profound verse, and I believe that. I believe it's one of the most profound verses in the entire Bible. And it just simply says, Jesus wept. Why is that so profound? Well, let's look at the context. The context is that Jesus is coming to a situation where someone has died. A close friend of his, Lazarus, has died. And Lazarus' family is upset. They're not only upset about the obvious situation that one of their family members has died and they're grieving and they're just experiencing all this pain, but they're also upset that Jesus didn't come sooner. So there's all these emotions flying around. But in the midst of that, the one thing that we absolutely know is that Jesus knows, going into it, that he is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knows this, going into it. Now, you know, if that was me, I would probably be super cocky coming into this situation, thinking I'm going to raise someone from the dead, you know, come in and just throw confetti all over the place and bust open the tomb, and Lazarus comes out with a marching band. You know, that's me making all this pomp and circumstance. But what does Jesus do? He weeps when he sees it. He knows that the situation is going to be righted, but he weeps. Why? Simply because death is sad. It's painful, this separation. He knows that Lazarus is going to raise from the dead, but he also knows that he's going to die again. It's not shortly after Lazarus is raised that it says they're already plotting to kill him. (laughs) He didn't make it very long. (laughs) He didn't have a long time to celebrate. So what do we see? We see Jesus weeping over this reality of death and pain. And if you ever find yourself thinking that God doesn't care about our pain and suffering, think about this moment. This is how God feels about pain and suffering. God has had to watch since the beginning of creation and the fall, almost every single person he created suffer a physical death. And the reaction is weeping. Jesus shows us that. So we know that pain and suffering is not an illusion. Two, we also know that God does not view suffering as meaningless. This would be the atheist perspective, the perspective that says, you know, well, I couldn't believe in a God, you know, that's all powerful and all loving because of the pain and suffering. So therefore, I must believe that pain and suffering is just the way it is. And there was an interesting interview between a pastor, Timothy Keller, and an atheist interviewer at Columbia University. And what the interviewer asked uh, Pastor Timothy is he says, okay, so you say you believe in a God that's all-powerful and all-loving, but how do you actually say that when you see all the pain and suffering in the world? How do you deal with that? And Timothy Keller just simply turned to him and said, how do you? And the crowd just went silent. And the interviewer really didn't know how to respond because he had no way. There's no, uh, if you, for him, who doesn't believe that there's a foundation in God and that God says there are things that are evil and there are things that are good, then everything is just what it is. There's no calling something good or bad. It's just how we feel about it. And so what that guy realized is that he had no way to deal with it. But we know that pain and suffering is not meaningless. Listen to this. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 5, 3 through 5. He says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we hope, or because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So somehow in this mystery of suffering and why it exists and and why we feel this, is the reality, what Paul says, is that somehow in this suffering, it produces perseverance. And somehow as we persevere, it builds our character. And somehow as our character builds, even out of suffering, our hope increases. Our hope increases 
in Jesus Christ. Our hope increases in heaven, in our eventual community with God for eternity. And somehow, that is often a mystery to us, this happens. Suffering actually gives us more hope. And some of you have experienced that. Some of you have gone through times of intense trouble and come out more firmly trusting God and stronger in your faith because of it. So sometimes, well, we know that suffering is not an illusion, and we know that it's not meaningless. But the third thing is the most important when we get down to it. The third thing is this. We can know that God does not view suffering with indifference. So we're sitting here, and we don't know what the reason is. But what we know it is not is that he doesn't love you or he doesn't care. And we know that because we take comfort in Christ's own sacrifice and his promise of the resurrection. I want to read you a quote by the guy I talked about before, Pastor Timothy Keller, on this idea of Christ's sacrifice. What he says is, Jesus lost all his glory so that we could be clothed in it. He was shut out so we could get access. He was bound, nailed, so that we could be free. He was cast out so we could approach. And listen to this. And Jesus took away the only kind of suffering that can really destroy you. That is being cast away from God. He took that so that now all suffering that comes into your life will only make you great. And for those who think Christ didn't suffer, they don't understand. Because Christ suffered immensely. Imagine a small child who is learning how to run and walk. And they fall and they scrape their knee and you feel bad for them and you, you know, brush them off and say, you know, it's going to be okay. And that is pain and suffering. That's, that's a small event of pain and suffering. But now imagine a husband and wife who've been together for over 40 years and one has to watch the other slowly die of a degenerative disease. I don't think anybody would try to argue that this event of pain and suffering matches this. This is so much harder because of the history, because of the years, because of the love that's been built there. And then you compare that to the suffering that Jesus went through. Imagine Jesus the Son, God the Father, existing eternally in perfect communion. And in the moment of his greatest need, Christ is hanging on the cross and he utters the words, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, the moment of his greatest need, the sin, our sin, and the sins of the people around in that time, and all future sins are on his shoulders. And he's paying the debt for that. And that sin is actually separating him from the Father who he has been with eternally. And that is an immense amount of suffering. But it's not only... Christ's suffering that we take solace in. There's also the future resurrection. We will live in perfect communion with God. Listen to this. In Revelation 21.4, it says, Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. And I think that oftentimes we can tend to view heaven as almost this consolation prize that we get when... We get through this life and yay, we get this thing at the end and it's really great. I don't think that's fully the biblical view. I think that the biblical view, it says there will be a new heavens and a new earth and there will actually be not just this consolation prize that we get, but a restoration of all that has been wrong. So from the fall until Jesus comes back, all of that pain, all of that grief will somehow in the wisdom of God and in the power of God, be righted, and it will be restored. It's not just the extra place we get to go. It's a restoration of all that has been wrong. You know, the world is filled with sadness. It's cursed by sin, and it's groaning for redemption, and someday that redemption will happen. And there's this beautiful line at the end of uh, Return of the King, which is the third book in the Lord of the Rings series, where this character, Sam, says he wakes up in a bed and he sees people that he thought were dead. And he realizes he's alive. He thought he was dead. And he says, you're alive. I'm alive. Is everything sad going to be made 
untrue. And that's profound because it's not saying, is everything going to be all right? Are things going to be better in the future? It's saying, are the actual bad things that happen going to be made untrue? Are they going to be truly righted, not just ignored? And I believe that the answer for us is also yes. And you may be saying, okay, aren't those just the easy Christian answer? Isn't it the crucifixion and eventually we get to spend eternity with God in heaven? Isn't that just the easy Christian answers? Is that really supposed to help me? And I would say, trying to not be too blunt, that if, if, you, don't, if you think that's an easy answer, then you don't actually understand what happened. You don't understand the crucifixion if you think that's an easy answer to pain and suffering. Because it wasn't easy for Jesus to be whipped and to be mocked. It wasn't easy for him to be nailed to a cross and to pull up for every breath. And it wasn't easy for him to be separated from God the Father who he had been with eternally. But through his suffering, he gave us the perfect example of how to suffer with dignity and with care. And he paid tenfold through his suffering so that we would not have to face the only kind of suffering that can truly destroy us, which is separation from God. That is what gives us our hope. That is what gives us our power. And I actually believe, I truly do believe that that's better than an answer. I think that when we have an answer, if we, if we got an answer for every single little thing that happened to us, or even the bigger things, that that would basically just tell us what reality is. But what the crucifixion does and what our hope of heaven does is it actually gives us power to face pain and suffering. It gives us the tools to be able to continue in relationship with God amidst that. And hopefully, it gives us enough power to, like Horatio Spafford said in that song, to look at God and amidst pain and suffering, somehow say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for sending your son to die in our place. And you sent him not to only suffer with us, but for us. And we can find strength in looking at your suffering, and if we truly understand what you did on the cross, we can find strength in that. We can find strength and realize that's not an easy answer. It's the hardest thing that was ever accomplished in the history of the world. And that's what we rest our strength in. That is what we rest our hope in. Father, I pray for the people in this congregation that are struggling, that are in the place of Job right now, and I ask that you're with them, visibly and present. And you bring people around them to support them. And you allow them to be able to continue this relationship with you, to not turn away, but fall into your arms. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for all that you have done for us and the strength that you give us amidst pain and suffering. In your name we pray. Amen. So I want to take a second just to hand off to our on-site and off-site venues. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming so much. Uh, for those of you who are interested a little bit more into some of the things we talked about today, and you're like, okay, that was not enough. I want some more. There's some resources. Uh, Timothy Keller's book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, C.S. Lewis, Problem of Pain. There should be some copies back in the cafe. If not, we can order them for you. Uh, I just want to tell you, especially in light of this message, we have people up here for prayer. I know there's people out there that are struggling and hurting, and I ask that you just have the courage to go up and ask for prayer. People want to pray with you, want to work through this with you. And if you're new, if this is your first time, welcome. We're so glad you're here. And we want to give you a gift. If you just walk out those doors into the Connection Center, we can not only give you a gift, but hopefully get you connected to this body of Christians here. So thank you, everybody, for coming, and have a great day.